Good evening, I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Thank you for joining us on this town hall discussion about the coronavirus pandemic in Nebraska. We're joined live by Governor Pete Ricketts, also by Labor Commissioner John Albin, and also by Dr. Ali Khan, the Dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. We've made this program available to C-SPAN for viewers across the nation and to broadcasters and other news outlets across the state. So we welcome everyone to this special edition of Speaking of Nebraska. And you can join the conversation tonight by calling us at 800-676-5446 or 402-472-1212. You can also send us an email at news at netnebraska.org and you can also contact us on Twitter and Facebook as well. We'll begin with you, Governor Ricketts. Uh, we were in these same seats last week. It's since, I always seem to get to go first. Exactly. <laughs> um, it's been an eventful week, as they all seem to be yeah. lately. Um, we now have uh, six deaths in the state of Nebraska. Uh, the number of cases has more than doubled in just the past seven days. We're currently at 258 cases in 27 counties. So as the one leading this effort and directing many of the decisions, how do you feel Nebraska's doing in this fight? Well, one of the keys that we have to do is continue to focus on the social distancing that we've talked about. You know, we've had this rule in place about a 10 person limit on public gatherings in place since the middle of March and it's gonna extend statewide till the end of April. But we've also issued directive health measures in um, 56 of our counties, which has got over 80% of our population, I think. And what those are doing is having more restrictions on top of that and some of those go till May 11th. And we really need to focus on each one of those issues because it's, it's a layered approach to how we slow down the spread of the virus here in the state. So there's no one single thing that is going to, you know, slow the spread of this virus. It's a lot of those things that all add up over time. I'm going to steal Dr. Lawler's uh, analogy of Swiss cheese. If you get Swiss cheese with a bunch of holes in it, you know, one slice doesn't stop very much. But if you keep lay layering more slices on top of it, eventually you block most of the holes. And that's what all of our different measures do. And that's what we need to continue to focus on. If you look at the data from the last three days, uh, for example, and just how many new cases we had, uh, we're measuring from noon to noon because that's you have to pick a 24-hour period. Uh, four days ago, we had 25 new cases, and then it jumped up to 37, and then 38, and then 36. So the good news about that is that we've had at least three days in a row where we really haven't seen the number of new cases continue to go up. Now, I don't expect that we can, will continue to sustain that, but it is good news that we haven't reached the, the point where this thing is going up in a you know, geometric fashion. So but that's no reason that we should let up. We need to continue to focus on all those things like staying six, six feet apart from people, don't go to gatherings of more than 10 people, um, you know, all the common sense stuff around hygiene and, and washing your hands often for 20 seconds, coughing into your elbow, don't touch your, your hands to your face. Um, you know, all those sort of things will help us make sure we can each be a part of controlling the spread of the virus here in Nebraska. And we're doing our own social distancing once again here on yep. the set as well. Also joining us is Commissioner of Labor, John Albin, uh, a history making day and not the kind of history we really want to make uh, when it comes to employment. Last week it was announced today a record breaking number of Americans filed for unemployment, including more than 24,000 Nebraskans just last week. That breaks the state's record for single week filings and that record was set the week before. So in the last two weeks, about 10 million Americans have filed for unemployment. Uh, Commissioner, how much worse do you think it's gonna get before it gets better? Well, that's a good question. Um, we anticipated once we kind of saw the events that were unfolding, we would see two to four weeks of a surge of claims. And we've certainly had those first two weeks of that this week will be another large week. Uh, I guess the big question will be the weeks beyond that, uh, week four. Um, but we think that the claims will mostly be filed in this next uh, two weeks. 
Also joining us on our set is uh, Dr. Ali Khan, the Dean of the College of Public Health at UNMC. And uh, in addition to that, retired Assistant Surgeon General, and you also worked with the Center for Disease Control as the Director of Public Health Preparedness and Response. And you've written a book called The Next Pandemic, which looks at bird flu and uh, Ebola and other infectious diseases. So this is something that you've spent a lot of time dealing with. Uh, I guess right now we are dealing with the title of your book, The Next Pandemic. Historically, how do you think this one is going to rate with some of the other major pandemics mankind has faced? So this one actually is analogous to what we saw in 2003. This is, this is the next SARS outbreak. We had a SARS outbreak in 2003, so this is a brand new SARS outbreak. We're fortunate so far that this isn't of the magnitude we saw of the influenza outbreak in 1918. But what we have learned is that these pandemics, and in this case an epidemic in the United States, can really stress our healthcare systems. And all we have to do is look across America as we look at what's going on in Washington or New York City and other cities to see what it does to healthcare systems. And we just have to look in our own state and see what happens when such a virus ends up in a long-term care facility and what can happen in a long care uh, long-term care facility. So these diseases can be quite devastating. Uh, and we see that now. And they also have impacts way broader than the health impact, as we're seeing. They have social impacts, they have political impacts, and they have economic impacts, even without necessarily large amounts of deaths and cases. Well, Dr. Khan, we got some projections this week from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington. So their analysis projects Nebraska will hit the peak of COVID-19 around April 23rd, and they are projecting 447 Nebraskans will die from COVID-19 by August. How do you feel? Do you think those estimates are accurate? So that's Chris Murray's work. Uh, so Chris does really good work. Uh, so the governor has actually asked us to look at this data ourselves. So we're um, validating this model. So we're creating our own model at the, at the university looking at our specific state data because Chris's model really was designed for the U.S. and it, uh, we're going to redesign it specifically for our state. But his model is consistent with what, we, what we're seeing across the U.S., which is that we should expect a peak of cases in the, here in Nebraska over the next two to three Three weeks that'll sort of start fall, falling off into the beginning of June. And um, so the model is consistent, but again, models are just to help you think about what's going to happen. I, I, they don't predict the future. They're just to help you think about what's going on and to help you think about how do we make sure, in this case, reminding people social distancing, reminding nursing homes, long-term care facilities what they need to do, reminding hospitals what they need to do, right? This is about making sure, I tell people, Preparedness is done. Implementation, implementation, implementation. Well, we have been uh, collecting questions ahead of tonight, and uh, we've received nearly 500 questions from all over the state. The question we've gotten <clears throat> most often by far is about the possibility of, stay at home, of a stay-at-home order for the entire state. Here's what we heard from two viewers. I'm Paul from Lincoln. Wouldn't it be prudent to take measures to prevent community spread as opposed to waiting for it to happen before implementing additional health directives. If there are cases in a community already, waiting for community spread comes off as a willingness to allow additional people to get sick without taking action. Hi, my name is Tracy and I'm from Alliance, Nebraska. At the March 31st White House press briefing, Dr. Deborah Burks commented that once a case is detected in the community, it is too late. She went on to say that our behaviors matter most at this time. With her warnings in the public domain, why has Nebraska not been placed under a stay at home order? Thank you. So Governor Ricketts, you've gotten this question a lot. What would you say to Paul and to Tracy? Well, first of all, let's take a step back that we actually um, have one of the best facilities, we're blessed with that, at University of Nebraska Medical Center. We've got one of three biocontainment facilities, the only federally funded quarantine unit. When the State Department was evacuating Americans from China, they sent them to military bases, except here, where they sent them to UNMC to help watch over the quarantine. So we've got world-recognized experts here in our state, and that's who we turn to to be able to help craft our plan. So we actually uh, got briefed on the virus on March 3rd, we met again with uh, folks like Dr. Lawler and Dr. Cradville on the 6th to start crafting our plan. Uh, we actually implemented that plan on March 13th. Uh, 
And that plan calls for a regional approach, understanding that the virus is not going to spread at the same rate across the state. And that's why we've broken it up by public health regions and using that uh, kind of the rule of thumb about community spread. When you got that one community spread case, that's when we place those public health districts under a more restrictive regime with a directed health measure. And the reason we do that is what we're trying to do is really time the directed health measure to be able to get the maximum impact out of it. Because if you go too early, people get tired of doing it and they can start breaking your ban just when you need them to actually be doing it the most. And if you go too late, well, then you get miss a lot of the benefit of going, uh, doing it at all. So what we have done is really try to time it to be able to do that based upon our consultations with UNMC to be able to create this methodology for how we're going to do it. So that's, that's kind of our general philosophy on how we're approaching it. And then getting back just to this idea of, um, you know, the stay at home things that's, you know, shelter at home that some people are doing, uh, uh, the number of states are doing. And, you know, Nebraska is not New York. New York probably was wealthy with the virus maybe by the middle of January. We don't have those direct ties to China, so we didn't have the same issues. You know, we're, we're, not, we're well behind New York as far as the spread of the virus in our state, and we took measures earlier. And so that's what these measures that we've talked about with regard to the 10-person rule, the, um, you know, washing your hands, six feet distance, um, shutting down elective surgeries and our directed health measures, everybody staying at home if somebody in your household is sick. All these things we've implemented as part of our overall plan, and we're following that plan through. The plan doesn't call for a sheltered home like some other states. We're doing a plan that's right for Nebraska. And we want to continue to work this plan and, again, let it roll out regionally across the state, but also understand it's got to be sustained, right? This is not something that's going to be over in two weeks. Uh, even at the end of April or May 11th when our directed health measures are coming up for expiration, we're going to reevaluate. We may extend them again. Uh, or even if we decide to loosen them up, we will do just that, only loosen them. We will not get rid of them. This is something that we've got to be in for the long haul, and we need people to stay committed to all these directed health measures through the entire thing. We can't have people falling off and deciding they're going to ignore the ban and, you know, uh, have birthday parties and stuff like that. You know, that's the kind of stuff we, we really got to make sure that people are sustained and committed to this through the entire duration of it. And so that's why we're trying to time it just right so that people don't get tired of it. So as I mentioned, we've gotten a lot of questions on this topic, so I'm going to drill down a little sure. bit further with some more questions just so we get a better understanding of it. So more I can states, talk about it for a long time. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, sure you can. More states have added those stay-at-home uh, orders this week. I think we're up to at least 38 states. Florida, at the beginning of this week, was taking a similar approach to Nebraska. They were doing it county by county. But Governor Ron DeSantis then abruptly changed course, and he did it after a phone call with President Trump. So one Nebraskan asked us on Twitter, has the president given you the okay to issue a statewide order to instruct Nebraskans to shelter in place? And if you aren't waiting for him to do that, then what are you waiting for? Sure. Well, again, getting back to it's not part of our plan to issue a shelter at home. We've got the plan that's right for Nebraska. Uh, you know, Nebraskans, uh, we're the only state, for example, with a unicameral. We're not afraid to go do the plan that's right for our state. So that's the plan we have. The president has not called me to talk to me directly about anything we're doing here. But what he has said publicly is that states, uh, the way we manage these things is locally executed, state managed, federally supported. And that states really need to decide what is best for their state, that all states are not alike. It's not a cookie cutter approach. That states need to decide how best to approach this to be able to make it work. So that's the approach we've taken here in Nebraska that we put together our plan you know, weeks ago we started implementing that plan. We're continuing to implement that plan. And that plan so far is working. So, for example, if you look, uh, at the first week of March, our traffic counts were up 2%. Well, as of the last week of March, they were down statewide an average of 29%. Omaha was down 28%. Lincoln down 32%. They are, you know, the measures we're putting in place are working. People are staying at home. And so our plan does have very restrictive measures in it. In some cases, like you, you mentioned Florida. I'll give you an example. So... In the Florida case, their shelter at home, you know, order allows people to go to religious services and no limit on how many people can attend those. Well, that, ours is actually more restrictive on that. So if you look at what we're actually doing compared to other states, in many ways, we're more restrictive than what other states are doing that supposedly have these shelter at home orders. If you look at Arizona and go compare what they're doing and compare what we're doing, you'd see, even though they, they, they say they're a shelter at home, it's very similar to what we're doing here, too. We have restrictive measures in place to be able to be able to, you know, get, get that social distancing, keep groups down, all that sort of stuff. But the important thing to remember is 
a shelter at home is not a silver bullet. There's not one thing that's going to work. It is a layered approach. It's that Swiss cheese analogy I started off with. The first layer is maybe that 10 person rule. The second is washing your hands. The third is the six foot distance. The fourth is not touching your hands and face. The fifth is making sure you stay home when you're sick and everybody in your household stays home. So you layer these one on top of another and that's how you create that barrier against the, the virus spreading. It's not just one thing, it's all those, those what we call non-pharmacological interventions, MPIs, that you lay, layer one after another. That's why it's so important that every Nebraskan participate, that everybody can be a part of the solution. We all gotta be doing our part to follow these directions so that we can slow the spread of the virus. So if President Trump, and you said you are in contact with the White House, with President Trump, with Vice President Pence, if President Trump asks you to put that in place, are you open to doing that? Well, again, I don't expect the president to do that, but I'm going to do what's right for Nebraska. You may recall just a few days ago, the president was indicating he was going to maybe loosen restrictions. And, um, you know, on Sunday on Jake Tapper's CNN show, I said, no, we're going to do what's right for Nebraska. So even if the president says he wants, like, churches open by Easter, we're going to do what's right for Nebraska. We already had a plan for what we were going to do. And it didn't involve taking these restrictions off because, again, like I said, you have to be in this for the long haul. I mean, this is something you can't do just in two weeks. What we've put in place here for the next, you know, it'll be a total of six weeks, but what, by the time we get to the end of April, longer in some of our parts of the state, we'll reevaluate, but we're not taking them off completely no matter what we do. We're going to be, if we decide to loosen them, we will loosen them gradually. And if we... Uh, we also may just decide to extend them further based upon what we think is going on with uh, the virus. And, you know, uh, uh, Coach Cook, John Cook, said something that I thought was great. He said, hey, if you want to watch football, I'm going to paraphrase him. He tweeted out, if you want to watch football this fall, follow these guidelines. You know, do all these social distancing measures we're talking about if you want to watch football. So uh, you've talked a lot about the plan that you have in place and you developed that plan with the experts at UNMC. It's been in place since, I think you said, March 13th. So Aaron on Twitter is asking, at what point will you reevaluate that plan for the people of Nebraska and talk more about the next phase of what that plan is? So is it going to be, is it a plan that you're constantly tweaking and constantly going back to and saying, is this right for Nebraska? Well, if we get significantly different data than what we expected, then obviously we'd go back and take a look at what we're doing. But we're still executing on the plan. So remember, we, we still have a number, uh, several of the public health districts that haven't uh, been issued a directive health measure. So we're still, and I expect that most of them will as well as, as the virus continues to spread across the state. Again, we don't expect it to spread at the same time. And the other thing, too, I'd, I'd mention is that our plan assumed that we would not have robust testing that we would have to use these rules of thumb like, hey, you got a case of community spread. So we're going to continue to um, you know, work the plan. But right now, like I said, we've got our most restrictive measures in place in many of our, our uh, health districts, Omaha and Lincoln included. And if you go back and look at the restrictions we've got, in many cases, they're more restrictive than what other states are doing. Commissioner uh, Albin, let's talk a little bit about unemployment. Um, obviously, we have a lot of people who are applying for unemployment benefits. Many of them have never done that before in their, in their work life. So what are the kinds of questions that you are getting about filing for unemployment? Well, I guess the first question we usually get is just, how do I do it? And it's really easy. Uh, you go to anyworks.nebraska.gov and you can file your application from there. Uh, they need they want to know what sort of information they will need on their claim. Um, you need your social security number, and if you've got a state ID or a driver's license, you need that information to feed in so we can do our security checks. Um, we get a lot of questions about how fast will we pay. Um, you know, the federal standard for unemployment is that you pay 80% within the first 21 days. Um, and so we're going to try and make that standard. It's probably three to four weeks out from the first, from the application to the payment. So we're going to work on that part of it. Um, and then I guess there's a question from a lot of people of whether they qualify or not. And we don't prejudge any claim. You file it and then we adjudicate it. But, you know, if it's just, I'm nervous, I want to stay home and I don't want to go to work anymore, you're not going to be eligible for benefits. On the other hand, if you've got a doctor's directive to stay at home and quarantine and then you're going to be eligible for benefits under the provisions of our uh, laws right now. So we've heard from dozens of Nebraskans about how long it takes to get a chance to talk to someone about filing for unemployment. Here's what one person told us. I'm James from Omaha. My question is, what's being done to ramp up the staff at the Nebraska Unemployment Office? 
I, along with several other people, have had questions about the application process and submitted questions through various channels, which are not able to be answered uh, due to the lack of staffing. I understand that folks are working 12 hours a day and doing the best they can. Uh, what are you doing in order to bring on more staff so they can deal with the volume of questions and applications coming their way? All right, well, we've done quite a few things. Uh, the first thing we did is we stood up a new call center in seven days. Uh, it's actually located in Omaha, and um, so we've used that. We're using that uh, private vendor to channel questions so that we can have seasoned staff spend the time answering the hard questions. Uh, one thing that I would tell everyone, though, is you really don't need to go on to talk to somebody on the phone to check on your claim. We have a new system up. It's been up since October. And under the new system, you can go online and get all those questions answered like, you know, have you received my claim? Actually, we send you an email to tell you that. So check your email box. Um, we can go, you can check on the claim to see if it's pending, if it's been paid, uh, all the, that sort of information. So I would seriously discourage people from using the phones if you're at all conversant with computers uh, because the questions are easier to find out and quicker and there's no hold queue uh, <laughs> if you use the online. <laughs> Commissioner, we did, John, you've also done things like you've nearly doubled the staff or maybe more than doubled the staff now that you had adjudicating these yeah. cases by moving people and over, that, right? That's a very good point and I should have mentioned it, but you know, when we started this three weeks ago, we had 34 adjudicators. The last time that I looked, we had 70. And then in addition to more than doubling that staff, we've been pulling people in from our employment and training programs and our labor standards programs and giving them the questions and having them respond to the emails and that sort of thing. So we've, I don't know what our functional number is right now, but it's a lot more than it was three weeks ago for sure. Right, and you're also seeking volunteers from other agencies to be able to yes. pull them in and get them trained up and help adjudicate some of these things and, or help administratively at least to try and smooth out the flow of the work. Yeah, that call went out today. Um, a lot of the agencies have people that are in the work at home status right now and so we're trying to solicit those, member, or those team members from the other agencies to come in and assist our staff and uh, help process more claims. And I think if the... If I'm remembering the numbers right, we actually completed seven, over 7,000, almost 8,000 claims last week. So our, we're getting at it. It's still going to be a battle, but we are getting at it very hard and ramping up the amount of staff. We did have one question that came in from Kelly in Waverly, and she says she's a substitute teacher who's now out of work, and she's interested in working at the Department of Labor to help out with the surge in cases. She's been trying to get in touch with someone there, hasn't, had, uh, hasn't been able to do that. Is that even an option? Oh yes, I mean we're we're in the hiring mode. Uh, just have her dial four seven one nine thousand and have her ask for Dirk Hood, and uh, he'll be ready for her call. That sounds good, uh, Dr. Connor. I want to bring you back into this conversation sure. at this point, um, and ask you first of all. We know uh, the reputation of UNMC. You have uh, you have the containment unit. You have the biocontainment unit. Is there anybody in there currently? Yes, absolutely, and so we're taking care of patients uh, currently. You know, you talked about the reputation of the biocontainment unit and the quarantine and the quarantine unit and the healthcare system, but uh, you know, I have to tell you about, if I may, digress. The reputation of Nebraska. So when uh, nobody wanted to take people from Wuhan. Nebraska was the only place that said, yes, we would take people from Wuhan. Actually, people, we had here at the Med Center, they had to refuse donations from Nebraskans who wanted to feed these people, give them <laughs> all sorts of stuff. Uh, and the same thing, when we originally agreed to take patients from the cruise ship, you know, Nebraskans were absolutely fine with that. So I'd like to always frame the amazing University of Nebraska Medical Center in the context of the state that state that we're in. But yes, we are currently taking care of patients and we're not only just providing them the best possible care in America, uh, we are also involved in a number of research studies that are helping us define where the science is going. So we want to answer critical questions in terms of how do people get infected. We want to answer critical questions of what are the best treatment options for people. So we're involved in a couple of drug trials. And so all that work is currently going on uh, at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. We got a question from Jenny, and uh, Jenny asks, if a person had COVID-19 and then recovered, 
and then was tested with the current COVID-19 test, would they test positive or would they test negative? Okay, so it's a complex question, Jenny. So um, if you have COVID-19 and you've recovered, so some people will continue to shed virus, or not, at least not shed virus, but let's just say you can continue to be positive with the current test for a while, and the current test looks for pieces of material, of genetic material in your body from the virus, and then you will, after a certain amount of time, you'll have no more virus anymore. Uh, so the current test would not work. However, there are other tests which look in your bloodstream for whether or not you've ever been infected, and those tests would then eventually become positive. Um, Governor, um, we got a question from Connor in Omaha, uh, and he asked, why have North Dakota and South Dakota, two less populated states than ours, tested more people? So we decided to look into this a little bit, and it, it, it is true that Nebraska has done the fewest number of tests in our seven-state region. Looking at the number of tests per one million people, Nebraska has done slightly more than Kansas, but otherwise is behind the neighboring states. For example, Nebraska has tested 2,189 per 1 million people compared to Wyoming, which has tested 4,259 per 1 million people. So why are the states doing things differently when it comes to testing? Well, I, I'm not in those other states, so um, Connor's got a great question there with regard to why does it look different. And I think it also gets back to, you know, how much of the materials did you have in your state? What kind of criteria did you use to be able to test people and really go to that? So, for example, right now, um, We've got capacity at our public health labs to do over 400 tests a day. UNMC is now up to about 300 uh, tests a day. CHI has their own test. They can do about th almost 300 tests a day. So you can see we're, we're building capacity from where we were just a uh, week or so ago. But we, even though we've got the capacity to do that, we haven't tried to overwhelm that system because what we've done is we've really focused on the people who are at highest risk. So it starts with people who, you know, when you, again, let's walk through a scenario here. So say you've got those flu-like symptoms. Okay, so you've got the cough, you've got shortness of breath, you've got a fever. Stay home. That's the first thing to do. Stay home. This is part of our rules that we want people to do. You immediately stay home. Don't go to an emergency room. Don't go to a clinic. Call your health care provider and make an appointment to go in. Also, if you're in one of our areas where we have a directed health measure, not only do you need to stay home, everybody in your household needs to stay home. This is really important because if you actually have the COVID virus, right, the coronavirus, we need to make sure everybody is staying home until we find out. So then you go into your doctor. You make an appointment. You call in. They keep you isolated. They're going to test you for influenza A and influenza B because, frankly, that's still more common right now in our state. So if you're negative for that, and one of the things we've done is we used to make you go through the respiratory panel as well, so if you had a respiratory disease. We've given health care providers now. We've loosened up those restrictions as we've been able to get more reagents. So we've loosened up those restrictions so that now the health care providers say, now we're going to waive that one off. We're just going to, he's negative for these. This person then will be, look at, have they traveled internationally? Have they traveled domestically? Are they over age 65? Do they have those underlying health conditions? Are they uh, somebody in a nursing home? Are they a health care worker? Are they a 24-hour facility person? Are they a first responder, uh, police officer, corrections officer, EMT, firefighter? If you're one of those categories, then you will be in that prioritization category to get tested. And the reason we've done that is we want to make sure that we've got the capacity to get that high-risk group, those important people, uh, tested first and not run out of capacity. And again, it's not necessarily the swabs and the test tubes with the viral media. Some of it's the reagents to actually run the test. And we are trying to buy those on the open market. And so this may be also one of the differences. Some of the states may have had more of that on hand than we did. Um, so we're trying to buy more of that on the open market to make sure we can continue to test people and not run out. Um, so that's a, another key factor we want to make in consideration. And then we also know that, you know, for example, what happened with Carter House Saturday night in Blair, uh, we're going to go in and sometimes in that nursing, you know, her home, we came in and wanted to test all the residents, all the workers. We've got to have the capacity to be able to do that. So there are going to be some of those emergent issues where we got to really go in and make sure we have the capacity again to test all those folks. So we've been really trying to make sure that we're not going to run out of the testing materials, the reagents, and making sure we're prioritizing those folks who are going to be at the highest risk. And even with all that, you know, testing all those people with the highest risk, right now we're still about, you know, 5.6, 5.8% of the people who are testing are testing positive. So the vast majority we're testing are not testing positive. And Michael from Omaha says, last week our first two deaths happened the same day after the testing came back positive. Why were they tested so late? Should we be testing earlier? 
Well, again, it gets back to the criteria, but let's take the, the first gentleman who died. You know, he was notified, he had gone to a conference, was notified at the conference there was somebody with coronavirus, and he was quarantining at home and, um, you know, didn't have the symptoms apparently to go present himself to a, a doctor or to a hospital or something like that. So, um, you know, he died at home, and the test was only done afterwards with regard to, it was, you know, to find out if, because he had been exposed, if he actually had the coronavirus. So that's an example of, uh, again, how if you're, um, you know, going to be one of those people who is going to be vulnerable to this and you get it, it, it could be potentially, you know, very dangerous. But it's also something that if you're not showing those symptoms, you may not be going to your doctor and may not be getting tested. Dr. Khan, do you want to weigh in on testing? Are, are we getting enough tests? Are we doing enough testing? What's your philosophy? So I think the governor has become a public health expert. As I was <laughs> saying, it's a 24-7 uh, pandemic uh, for you. So, uh, uh, so everything's spot on. We're having trouble with what's essentially re extraction kits. Uh, and that's one of the limiting factors. We're not the only ones in America who are having trouble with uh, getting enough people tested, but there's no doubt that we need to ramp up testing, not just in this state, we need to ramp up testing across America because one of the end games for this virus will be testing enough people to identify who's positive, pulling them out of the community for isolation and making sure that we can quarantine contacts. And that's not gonna happen unless we have widespread testing across the state and across the US. Yeah, and I don't think there's any governor who feels like they've got enough testing. We had a question that was phoned into us from Donna in Bellevue, and uh, Governor, you talked about uh, not doing elective surgeries. She's asking about uh, abortion clinics, saying, "With the, will the closing of the abortion clinics in Nebraska be enforced?" She's referring specifically to the one in Bellevue. I don't think you're saying that all abortions are out. It's between a doctor and the patient. Is that what you're right? So when we're talking about uh, elective surgeries, and we include elective abortions in there as well. So uh, a part of our DHMs include. Um, discontinuing any elective surgery, but it also is not only for those elective surgeries that would include elective abortions, but it's also for veterinary services, for dental services, all that. Uh, specifically with regard to the one in Bellevue, uh, you know, we've received a complaint about it, so we're going to be following up on that complaint. Uh, ultimately, it'll be up to the Bellevue Police Department to go enforce it, but, it, you know, it starts with an investigative process first, just like anything else, and we've got to create a, you know, process where anybody, not just abortion clinics, but anybody who is doing elective surgeries in prohibited areas is being investigated and, you know, determined whether or not they are actually within the law or outside the law. You are watching a special episode of Speaking of Nebraska with Governor Pete Ricketts, also Nebraska Chief Commissioner of Labor John Albin, and Dr. Ali Khan from the University of Nebraska Medical Center. We are answering the phones and answering your questions about COVID-19 in Nebraska. You can give us a call at 800-676-5446 or 402-472-1212. Next question is for Governor Ricketts. Right now, most of the cases in Nebraska are clustered in and around Omaha, but it is spreading to the entire state. So we have a question from one viewer about plans for rural areas. I'm Christine DeVillier from Ashland, Nebraska. Governor Ricketts, you've suggested multiple times that our small and rural hospitals will take a business as usual approach, transporting patients whose needs cannot be met by their smaller facility to larger hospitals, larger facilities. You've also reminded us that with loosened restrictions, uh, hospitals can now use alternative spaces to house their patients as needed. These are ideas. Please tell us specifically, what have you done to prepare small and rural hospitals to be able to serve the needs of their patients on site as evidence around the globe has proven that this will become necessary? Also, what measures have you taken to ensure that the systems for transporting these patients to larger facilities is robust and capable of handling a regional outbreak, which we might face in the coming days? Thank you. Governor? Great. Well, hey, thanks, Christine, for that question. Again, I certainly didn't mean to imply it was business as usual. What I was talking about when we were talking about rural hospitals transporting patients to larger hospitals was there is a procedure in place to be able to do this already. So this is something that happens already in Nebraska where maybe a smaller hospital doesn't feel like they can provide the level of care they need to for a patient and they transfer that person to a larger hospital. So that kind of general procedure is in place. Now obviously the transportation companies have to be trained with regard to how to do that. Again, this is something that UNMC does when they were transferring some of the patients 
uh, that we received from like the Diamond Princess to the uh, quarantine unit at UNMC. So again, these are protocols and procedures that are already established. One of the big things we've been working on is working to be able to get those, that protective equipment out to our local public health districts. So we have received a little over half or about half of the distribution we're gonna get from the federal government from a strategic national stockpile. And we have, so that would be things like, again, masks and gowns and gloves and that kind of thing, uh, face shields, and getting that out to our local public health districts. And then we're also looking at the state of Nebraska to buy more. Now we understand when we've asked other, you know, all of our healthcare providers that they need to go out and see what they can do about acquiring some. But frankly, what we're finding is that it's very, very difficult to actually buy any of this right now. We're hoping as the state of Nebraska buying in larger bulk, maybe with some of our relationships will be more successful. And so we're trying to buy all this PPE, bring it in and get it distributed out to where it's needed. So last week, what we asked all of our public health departments, we sent them a form, said, hey, tell us what your needs are gonna be under kind of peak kind of conditions. What do you think you're gonna need for PPE? Uh, and be specific. And so um, we've been reaching out and talking to those folks. I actually have uh, weekly calls with all the uh, with hospital CEOs. We have weekly calls with all of our public health directors where we're talking about these specific steps that we're doing to try and distribute the PPE to be able to get them the, you know, the materials they need. And then of course, one of the other things out there gets back to the testing. And the, the same testing protocol that we use in Lincoln and Omaha are the same testing procedures that we would use anywhere across the state. And that's how we've been able, for example, to find some of those cases in Knox County or Nemaha or Gosper, uh, where we do have rural areas where we've detected coronavirus. So uh, we're taking a number of steps, and I, and I think the biggest thing we are hearing from our smaller hospitals is about making sure they've got that PPE. Mm -hmm. And that's, what, that's been a, a huge focus for us to be able to go out there and try and buy it in the marketplace. As you can imagine, there are lead times for this. Um, some of my colleagues in other states have found that they've had orders canceled. We've had some challenges with that kind of thing as well. So it, it is a challenge, but we think at the state that um, you know, we can be, uh, with a bigger buying power, we can be able to help get people that really important information so that those workers, whether it's the EMT folks or the healthcare workers or whomever, law enforcement, can have that proper protection. Can I extend that? Sure, absolutely. If I may, Jump if in I may Governor. So, Christina, great question. I want to go back to the first comment I made here about protecting vulnerable people and vulnerable institutions. So I had a conversation with Craig at the radio station in Gordon, Nebraska yesterday morning, and it was this was the exact same question, Christina, about hospitals uh, and long-term care facilities, et cetera, but coming back to hospitals and EMS, and it's this is the time for these hospitals to be saying, what, how am I working with all of the other hospitals in the area in my regional sort of hospital collaborative coalition? How am I working with the hospitals in the state to think about how are we thinking about patients from a bigger level across the whole state, how we move patients across the whole state, how are we working with the Nebraska Hospital Association? Uh, we've, we're learning across the United States, you can't be the one-off expecting, I'm gonna take care of everything all by myself. Yes, we need to make sure you have the equipment, et cetera, to transport patients, to protect yourself if patients show up, but you really need to be thinking about how are you working as part of a system that's providing the best possible care for everybody within your community. Yeah, and just uh, to kind of wrap up a little bit also, this week I signed an executive order that loosened up some of the regulatory restrictions on our, our critical access hospitals. They were limited, to, for example, to 25 beds. I think Christine mentioned that, that we loosened it up so they could have more beds, they could create alternative beds. We also uh, loosened up some of the licensing restrictions so they'd be able to go out and hire more people and bring them in. So those are some of the other specific steps we've taken to be able to make sure that those hospitals will be able to go out and look to see, basically see how they can flex up to, to handle people who are coming in with coronavirus. Labor Commissioner Albin, I want to ask you a question that came to us uh, over the phone from Rosemary from Hebron. She says, will farmers be able to apply for unemployment along with the other groups of people who are self-employed? Yes, uh, farmers will be able to apply as will other self-employed people, um, the gig economy type of people. Uh, under the Federal CARES Act that was just passed last week, there is what's called uh, Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, PUA, and it is open to anyone who's self-employed like a farmer. So all they have to do, they, it's, we have a one-size-fits-all process for getting people in the front door. They, if they go to any works, they should go ahead and file. It will tell them they're not eligible for unemployment, and that's the correct answer because the federal government considers it a different program, and you can't get in the door on the 
pandemic unemployment assistance until you've been ruled ineligible for the uh, state benefits. And they shouldn't worry at all about getting that negative and, and we will pick up those claims. We have COVID-19 questions that we've added to our litany of questions. So they'll pick up the COVID-19. We'll pick them up and then we'll come back in and um, make the contacts with them to get the full claim. Hopefully the feds will give us a uh, go ahead by sometime this week because we have the software. We think we're pretty much ready to go unless they throw us a curveball that we'll be able to actually have a full litany of questions going forward. But uh, for right now, if you're a farmer and the COVID uh, situation is a COVID outbreak has shut you down, go ahead and go online and apply anyworks.nebraska.gov. Maybe um, you could also, I'm sorry, Dennis, yeah. maybe you could also just talk about um, independent contractors and people working for nonprofits too. Yes. Um, the people working for the independent, or the independent contractors come in through the same front door under the uh, pandemic unemployment assistance program. If you're, um, most, most employees of nonprofits are, are covered already because the exception is only for very small, but there are a group of nonprofits, the religious organizations that are exempt under the state unemployment law. They will pe be, be people that will be picked up under the pandemic unemployment assistance. So all doors go through anyworks.nebraska.gov and so they should go in and apply. Their benefit will range between $174 and $400, $440 in state benefits. And then because of the provisions of the CARE Act, they will also receive what we call the federal pandemic unemployment compensation, the additional $600 a week, just like the regular unemployment plan people. So they should go in, get their application in. We'll catch up. If they get their application in, we go back to the week they applied, not the week we get done with the claim. So. Uh, we will be working very hard on getting those claims up and running. Commissioner, I want to ask you one more question that came in from Marvin in Lincoln. He says, if I have an employee, who do, an employee who doesn't feel safe working in public, but I feel like it's safe, can that employee quit and then get unemployment? No, that employee will not be eligible. There's a, ser a series of conditions that will get you through the door. You can that would make it a good cause quit, but those are your doctors ordered you to stay home, you're having to stay home to take care of uh, children, or a, an ill spouse and that sort of thing. But people who just want to quit their job because they don't feel safe will not be eligible for any state or federal benefits. And uh, Jim from Papillion asked, due to coronavirus, if your hours are reduced to cut the monthly payroll, does the employee get to claim partial unemployment or do they just lose that part of their monthly salary? No, they, do, they are not going to lose all of their money. There's two ways they can come in the door depending upon the number of hours. They, Nebraska allows workers with part-time employment or partial hours to claim under the regular plan. Uh, so they, are, they can draw benefits. Also, we would strongly encourage employers to adopt a short-time compensation plan. Under the short-time compensation plan, and if an employer reduces your hours somewhere bet between 10 and 60%, we will pay you the same amount or same percentage of your unemployment benefit as, so if you're 60% reduction in hours, you'll get 60% of your unemployment benefit. And then on top of that, we just got the news this afternoon, actually early evening, that the federal government's made the decision that that entire $600 uh, additional payment will be applied to those. So you'll get the 40% from your employer, 60% of your unemployment benefit amount, and then the $600 amount on top of all of that. All right. Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, question now for Governor Ricketts. Uh, Tyson from Lincoln asked us, with the recent uh, study from the Institute for Health Metrics at the University of Washington, saying that Nebraska has the resources to manage COVID-19 with the possibility of having resources to spare, is Nebraska planning on sending any of that spare equipment to harder hit states such as New York. Let's take a look at that projection, which shows a peak in cases around April 23rd, and that Nebraska might not go over the 232 available intensive care unit beds. So if Nebraska has spare equipment, would that get sent elsewhere? Well, uh, Tyson, great question. Uh, I would say, first of all, that's just one model. And, uh, exactly. and as Dr. Connery said, models are just to help you think about it. They're not predictive necessarily. Correct. So, and in fact, um, this is what Dr. Conn is helping us think about as well with some of the models he's working on. Correct. To be able to try and match up what are our resources? What do we think that peak is going to be? I mean, the whole goal of everything we're doing is to make sure we don't overwhelm the healthcare system. 
And if you, if Tyson, if you did go in and look at that, you might notice um, it's a very narrow margin, even in that model, with regard to things like intensive care unit beds. So there's not much margin of error in that one, and it is just a model. So right now, we don't have um, really the insight to be able to understand how close to that line we're going to be. Uh, obviously, you know, that model shows that we're you know, doing well, but it's also something that you know, we've still got to continue to do more, more work. Dr. Khan's going to update it for more Nebraska-specific stuff. We're going to have to take a look at that and then try and match that up to what our resources are. So it's, it's really premature to know if we would be able to offer to take other people's patients, if we'd be able to you know, send ventilators someplace else or anything like that. We really have to do more of our uh, homework here. And, we, and again, we've got to remember, all this depends on us continuing to stay committed to those social distancing guidelines and directives that we put out. So if people start getting tired and stop paying attention to these things, they start shaking hands again, they start uh, going out to places where there's more than 10 people, if we start seeing that breakdown, that changes that model, right? So we got to stay committed to this for the next six to eight weeks to be able to make sure that we can keep control on the spread of the virus. So it really is premature and it's the kind of thing that's going to change based upon how well Nebraskans are continuing to follow the social distancing guidelines. Dr. Khan, you I want tell to Matt, if, if you want a different number, just, just go to Imperial College and look at Neil Ferguson's model, and you'll see a very different number. So just, just be careful basing an assumption on one specific model. I had another question that was uh, sent in to us, uh, Dr. Khan. It says there are quite a few people who feel they've already had COVID-19. Is there a way for those people to know? Uh, in the future, there will be correct. So there's, um, there, as we started earlier, when Jenny asked about when you first get virus and then, you know, s seven days later, the viral load comes down. So there's multiple ways to test. So we use a test called PCR that directly looks for the virus in your blood. But there's another test that looks for your immune response to the virus, and that's called a serology test. And those are already being developed and available. Um, and yes, yeah, so in the future, we will have these tests available and you could go get your blood tested and say, oh, yeah, in the past, you happened to get infected with the SARS coronavirus, too. More questions, too, about vaccine. How close are we to a vaccine? And what kind of uh, part would UNMC maybe play in that? Okay, so... Um, I always like to caution people, and if I haven't cautioned people enough, so this is not flu. So remind people that for things like HIV, we still don't have a vaccine, right? So never assume we will have a vaccine. But in the best case circumstances, we are probably 12 to 18 away from months away from a vaccine. Right. And this is based on fast tracking everything. There's lots of approaches out there to look for vaccines currently. And we already have, I believe, two vaccines that have gone into people's arms already. So which is really fast. OK, but I just want to just want to caution people who who, you know, who may hear 12 to 18 months and go, you know, 12 to 18 months, we're going to have a vaccine. We hope at that time frame, but it's not guaranteed, especially since our first effort at the old SARS vaccine actually was not successful. So that's for vaccines. And yes, uh, UNMC would be involved in trials and development and other activities, as always. So we've heard a lot, even from Governor Ricketts, about social distancing. Um, how do we, as we, as we go forward with that, um, how, how, when it comes to social distancing, are we talking about even just breathing or just talking to someone? Can it be transmitted that way? So the main, the main way disease is transmitted to people is respiratory droplets. So that sneezes, coughs, the absolutely talking to each other as you spit on each other, which is why we're six, six, feet. Feet, six feet away from each other. That's the main way that disease is spread to people. Now, unfortunately, this disease is not like the old version of SARS where you just spread it when, when you're sick. In this disease, you spread it probably two days before you're sick. So that makes it problematic because essentially you feel fine, but you're spreading disease. And there's probably people, a small amount of people who have no symptoms and they also spread it, but mainly through these respiratory droplets and then also through contact, which is why we tell people, keep those hands clean, don't touch your face. So those are the two main ways 
uh, that it spreads. So, you know, keep washing those hands, you know, don't touch your face. And my exp I already make, I already recommend that people wear masks uh, because when they're out and about because of this uh, spread. If you don't even know you're sick, uh, you could be, if you're sick, you should be home. <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about masks when you're sick. Be home. But you potentially could be feeling fine, but you're not sick yet. And I think even CDC is reviewing the mask issue. But wash, wash those hands, stay home if you're sick, uh, and follow those, you know, again, it's about protecting you and protecting your neighbor, and most importantly, protecting the most vulnerable people in our community. Because it's pretty clear, if you look at, the, the governor's talked about all six deaths, you know, if you look at their age groups, if you look at what's, what sort of illness they have, these are the individuals who are at high risk. So let's protect them. And we have, each and every one of us has the power to protect our fellow citizen in Nebraska. Use that power. Governor Ricketts, I want to get to a couple of topics that we've had a number of questions on. One of them involves state workers. Paulo from Bellevue says, what infrastructure is being put in place currently to allow state employees, in her case, CFS and Medicaid, but state employees in general, to be able to work from home for an extended period of time? Are we looking at the possibility of furloughs when it comes to state workers? So uh, we are actually doing everything we can to really protect the, everybody's income when you're working for the state of Nebraska. So uh, some of that will be if you're sick, staying home and using your sick time. We are allowing uh, associates to be able to donate sick time and that time off, that paid time off. Uh, we are looking to get people to work from home as much as possible. So a number of our agencies have been very successful in that. I know we've got uh, leaders like our chief human resources officer, Jason Jackson, is doing that. He's, he's, he's working from home as well, you know, trying to do some of that during the week. So we, uh, we've got a number of people doing that. Uh, we also have people we call in uh, like ready work status, which basically means uh, we don't want you here in the office. We're going to actually pay you just to be ready to work in case we need you. So John was talking about how we're looking for volunteers to be able to help out in the Department of Labor. We might be able to take some of those ready to work status people to say, hey, uh, you know, would you volunteer to go work in the Department of Labor? So we do expect this uh, to be something that, again, we got to be committed to this. This is something that's going to not be a short term thing. So, you know, obviously, at least till the end of April, some places in the middle of May, even when we start bringing down restrictions, we're going to loosen those up gradually. So I, I do want to set the expectation for everybody. This is going to be a sustained thing, but we are going to do everything we can to stay in Nebraska to be able to hold on to our teammates. And, you know, this is one thing I would say to every employer, too. If you can at all possible, figure out how to hold on to people because we will get through this. We will maybe not back to the old normal, but there will be a new normal. And remember, the, the thing that we were talking about when it came to workforce before this was that we didn't have enough people. Employers could not find enough people to hire. So I'd encourage employers to figure out ways to hold on. And by the way, not only did John say, hey, um, you know, we can hire at the state of, or at the Department of Labor. We're looking for people in Department of Health and Human Services, in our Nebraska State Patrol, in corrections, and in our Department of Veterans Affairs. So we got a number of job openings that if people are looking to come work for the state of Nebraska, we are hiring. And I think it's like statejobs.nebraska.gov you can go to, statejobs.nebraska.gov to go look for those opportunities because we are hiring right now. So if somebody's seeking an opportunity, we'd love to talk to you. Also want to ask you about, we got probably more than 10 questions from people, uh, women asking about giving birth over the next few weeks and months. So Allie in Omaha said many women in Nebraska want to avoid delivering at the hospital because of infection risk, the possibility of not having support people in the room, and the fear of being separated from their newborn if one of them shows symptoms. So will hospitals allow women to have partners and doulas and other support people in the room during birth? And with restrictions in place, can midwives still attend home births? So uh, I'll, ask the, I'll answer that last one first because I don't know the answer to that one. We'll have to get back to Kelly on that one. But if you just call my office, 402-471-2244, 402-471-2244, leave your name and phone number. We'll, we can follow up with you on the midwife question. With regard to uh, giving birth in a hospital, first of all, I'd still consult with your health care provider. Um, our hospitals are going to be safe. So, and I know in Omaha, for example, this question came up earlier this week, they are going to allow a birth partner in the uh, birthing room with uh, the woman who's giving birth. So at least one person is going to be allowed to be in there. I think the other thing to remember, and Dr. Khan, maybe you can comment on this, you know, you were talking about people who are going to be uh, vulnerable, right? And so a lot of this, what we think about is somebody who's got diabetes or 
uh, respiratory disease or pulmonary disease, uh, somebody along those lines. But also, I believe, aren't pregnant women, don't, and aren't their immune systems somewhat um, suppressed during pregnancy? Yeah. So they're kind of in that category as well from the standpoint of that we want you to be more careful if you're pregnant? We'd like you to be more careful, but there's no data suggesting that we're seeing greater risk of deaths amongst pregnant women yeah. at this point. But be more careful. Always be more careful. Always be more careful. We'd, ra we'd rather them not get. We'd rather them not get infected. Careful is good. Yes. Uh, in our few remaining moments here, I want to turn back to Commissioner Albin. We have a phone uh, phone question from Scott and Lincoln. If I recently exhausted my unemployment benefits for the year, how do I apply for additional aid under the new federal aid package? Just go back into anyworks.nebraska.gov and ask to reopen your claim, and. There's a federal, there's 13 additional weeks provided for under the new federal program under the CARES Act, and we will get you rolling on that process. We have all the agreements in place with the federal government. They just haven't given us the guidelines for actual dispensation of the payments. And again, very short amount of time, but uh, our one question that just came in over the phone, are we tracking recoveries in the state? Can you do that in 30 seconds? So I, I can do it faster than that. Actually, we are not tracking recoveries right now in the state of Nebraska. We're very focused on the uh, number of people who are infected and the, the folks that are in the hospital. Okay. Governor Pete Ricketts, thank you very much. Uh, also, Dr. Ali Khan from the University of Nebraska Medical Center and uh, the author of the book, The Next Pandemic, which we are probably living through right now. Thank you very much for your time as well. And Commissioner Albin, thank you for being in as well. And that is all the time that we have tonight on this special edition of Speaking of Nebraska. Thanks to all of our guests and thanks to the NAT crew working behind the scenes to bring this program to you. Governor Ricketts is updating the public on the state's coron coronavirus response each weekday at two o'clock central. You can watch those news conferences live online at netnebraska.org. You can also listen to those updates live on NET Radio. You can watch tonight's program online at netnebraska.org slash coronavirus. Next week on Speaking of Nebraska, we will bring you the latest on the coronavirus pandemic. So we invite you to tune in then and throughout the week as we continue to cover the story of the coronavirus pandemic across the state of Nebraska and across the entire country. Until next week, I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Thanks for watching.